Welcome everyone, glad you could join us uh, from wherever you are in the world. Um, good that you could uh, make it today. Uh, we're going to be covering some really exciting material. I'm Dr. Michael Sala and uh, we are going to be looking at exactly what's going on with China and its secret space program. We still have a few people uh, joining us. I'll just uh, spend a few minutes just kind of like introducing why I uh, began to do this research on China. What is it that made me very interested in China? Uh, I went to China in December of 2018. And one of the things that really struck me was the way in which uh, in the major cities that I visited, Shanghai and Beijing, uh, th there weren't any vestiges of a, of a old city. You know, when you travel often, uh, wherever you go, I've been to many different countries, uh, Turkey, Indonesia, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, you see an old city, you see, you know, those small dilapidated uh, streets, you know, cobblestones, especially in European cities. Well, China did away with all of that. It basically obliterated any vestiges of old cities in its uh, industrial heartland those major cities of Beijing and Shanghai and basically built what today would be regarded as a high-tech industrial city. Uh, very glitzy shopping malls, high-rise towers everywhere you go and uh, very wide boulevards. You know, no indication that you are in an ancient capital. You would look at it as though you are visiting something that was only built very recently. And, and that really got my attention because I thought, wow, the, the Chinese really did start from scratch. They really did wipe out all records of their ancient history or culture, uh, the Communist Party that is, and built what they believed to be a modern metropolis using the latest industrial uh, development policies. And this is something that really got my attention. And another thing that got my attention in speaking to people, uh, we did presentations in Shanghai and Beijing on secret space programs. And I'm talking of course about American secret space programs. And one of the things that really got my attention was the fact that uh, you know, people wouldn't say too much about what's going on in China, but still I did hear a little bit of feedback and what, was very interesting were comments that China also has a secret space program and that the current president Xi Jinping doesn't know about it or he's out of the loop. He doesn't have any power with that. And so that also got my interest. It's like, well, how could that be? So this presentation that uh, we are going to be covering today, I'm, I'm going to be looking at how China's secret space program began. You know, what its what its origins are and how China transformed from a, a technological backwater to a military superpower in space today. So we're going to be covering that. So let's begin and the start of this journey is in the United States in the 1930s when this gentleman Dr. Shen Shu Shen uh, went to the United States as a, a budding engineer in aeronautical sciences. Uh, he went first to the MIT and then he went to Caltech and he got his uh, master's degree and his PhD, uh, these, uh, PhD degrees from those two institutions. Uh, and he's widely considered the father of China's space program. Uh, and by that, we're talking about the conventional rocket program, uh, the program that many of you have probably read about in, in many uh, newspaper reports where China has uh, established, uh, has sent astronauts or taikonauts into space, uh, sent probes to the moon, um, actually has even landed a, uh, a rover on the moon itself. It's uh, and so China has a conventional space program using rockets, just as the United States and Euro Europeans have conventional rocket-based programs. But China also has a secret space program. And he, as I will show you, 
is the father of that. So how did he get to be the father of China's secret space program? Um, it began from his studies in the United States. He was a gifted, brilliant aeronautical engineer and scientist. Uh, and the key event that occurred in his development was that his thesis supervisor at uh, California Institute of Technology was uh, Dr. Theo Theodore von Kármán. And von Kármán was the guy that basically set up uh, JPL. Uh, he was the one that encouraged a group of graduate students at, at uh, Caltech, including Dr. Shen, to establish a rocket propulsion uh, think tank. And Dr. Von, uh, von Kármán was able to raise money uh, from the Army Air Force, as it was called at the time, for rocketry in the United States. So this was uh, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, uh, JPL uh, began. And Dr. Shen was one of the founders of JPL, which is not widely known. So he's one of the founders. And uh, Dr. Von Kármán is the guy that, uh, was, was, had, that had set it all up. Okay, so Dr. Van Kamen has set it all up and he was asked by the five-star general running the Army Air Force at the time, uh, General Hap Arnold. And uh, General Arnold was the guy that was in charge of the Army Air Force uh, throughout the Second World War. And so these were people running the, the military were aware of just how far uh, the Germans had advanced in the aerospace image, uh, industry. General, Hammer, uh, General Arnold knew that the Nazis in particular had made some remarkable breakthroughs in aeronautical science. And so he wanted to have uh, America's best scientists, the people who were able to understand the possibilities of supersonic uh, aircraft, supersonic rocketry, anything that was beyond the conventional, anything considered to be breakthrough aerospace technology. And he wanted to know, well, how would this affect the Army Air Force over the next decade, two decades, for up to 50 years? So he asked uh, Dr. Von Kármán to, to basically be a, to, to head up this uh, exclusive think tank to, to understand what was going on in Germany. So what was going on in Germany? This is one of the things that I've uh, discussed in previous uh, books in my Secret Space Program book series. And the basic idea is that the Germans were doing a, a lot of research into flying saucer technology. They were developing different configurations of flying saucers. They were uh, attempting different propulsion systems for the saucers. And, and the Germans had something that we would recognize today in terms of different corporations bidding on these uh, contracts in terms of, well, who can make a, a flying saucer using uh, an electrogravitic propulsion system? Uh, with a particular navigation system. So this would be something that uh, the German military put out. And so they had different contractors making bids and different contractors building prototypes. So this is why at the end of the Second World War, uh, there were so many different unfinished or incomplete flying saucer prototypes that were being discovered by the, by the Americans and the British and the Russians, because these were prototypes that uh, were unsuccessful. But the Germans had developed successful prototypes as well. Uh, and so this was something that the uh, Army and the Navy in the United States were very familiar with. They, they had spies embedded um, in, in Germany, in Nazi Germany, uh, probably one of the best known stories is from William Tompkins, who the second volume of his memoirs just came out. And this was something that uh, he was basically very aware 
he was very aware of uh, the different prototypes that were being developed. There were approximately 30 different prototypes that had been developed by the Germans, different configurations and types of flying saucer craft. And so this was something that was being brought back into the United States in terms of information that Navy spies were transmitting to different think tanks within the United States. So William Tompkins was involved in that and he gave us a lot of information about exactly what was going on. So as the war starts coming to an end, uh, the Army Air Force and the Navy begin making preparations for basically looking for all of the technologies that uh, the, the Germans uh, had developed, all of these breakthrough aeronautical technologies. The Army and the Navy were very interested in that. So in the case of the Army Air Force under General Hammond, uh, General Arnold, what, what happened was that they basically uh, convened something called the Scientific Advisory Group. So Dr. Von Kármán uh, was basically the, the head of that. And as you can see um, on the slide there, there's a document that was released uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, basically a declassified document. And, just, and it just shows you uh, the Army Air Force uh, the, the scientific advisory group that was convened under Dr. Von Kármán uh, to basically advise the Army Air Force on what it could do to study and bring back to the United States all of these technologies that the Nazis had developed, bring into the United States uh, some of the scientists, the German scientists that were involved in these uh, technologies, and then write a 10 to 50 year blueprint, a blueprint for how the United States, uh, how the Army Air Force could begin to basically duplicate or move forward in developing those breakthrough technologies. As essentially, what was happening was that they had discovered that the Germans had made a lot of progress in developing these flying saucer technologies uh, with all of these different prototypes, and that some of the prototypes were successful. And, and so the Army Air Force wanted to find out, well, what do we need to do to develop our own breakthrough aerospace technologies? So they convened uh, this uh, scientific advisory group that was headed by uh, Dr. Von Kármán. And Dr. Shen Shu Shen was on the list of consultants for that. So his name is highlighted in that document. So you can see he was actually part of this group uh, that was part of the scientific advisory uh, that was set up by the Army Air Force. And also he was uh, part of the three-man staff that helped Dr. Von Kármán. So it wasn't just that Dr. Shen was uh, a consultant for this group. He was also Von Kármán's right-hand man, part of his three-man personal staff. So that meant Dr. Shen was at the pinnacle in terms of the kinds of secrets that the Army Air Force was gathering from Nazi Germany as the war was coming to an end. So, of course, the war did come to an end. And as many of you probably know, uh, the US sent teams over to Nazi Germany to find out you know, how far did the Germans get, go. So the pro the um, operation lusty lusty is just an acronym uh, which stands for a luftwaffe science and technology uh, and and basically operation lusty was uh, there were two to three teams sent to germany to find out what breakthrough aerospace technologies had been developed and these two to three teams were sent there to to basically find out what technologies had been developed that were breakthrough, that would be of interest to the Army Air Force, and which German scientists would actually be helpful in uh, understanding those technologies and for the Army Air Force reverse engineering them. So there were two to three teams, and I say that because officially 
uh, the first team under Operation Lusty, um, that was uh, basically army personnel that went to occupy Germany to just find all of the advanced aerospace technologies that the Germans had worked on. We're talking, of course, rockets, the V1, V2 rockets. We're talking the Messerschmitt uh, jets um, and any, any other kind of breakthrough aerospace technology that would be of interest to the Army Air Force. And so they would have found those technologies and bring them back to the United States. So that was the first team, find the technologies and bring them back to the United States. The second team was a science team. And that was the team that was headed by Dr. Von Kármán. And Dr. Shen, this Chinese scientist, he was a part of that team. And their job was to interview scientists were, that were involved in the development of these breakthrough aerospace technologies, uh, such as uh, V1, V2 rockets, Messerschmitt jets, and, and so forth. So that was Dr. Shen's uh, job. And so Dr. Shen traveled to China, uh, traveled to occupied Germany at, uh, at the end of the Second World War. So he was there in uh, May and June of uh, 1945. And so there you see him wearing the cap. Uh, and, and he was given a rank of uh, colonel. So he's given the temporary rank of colonel. And uh, he is there and he is, uh, next to him is uh, Theodore von Kármán who was given a temporary rank, I think it was general. Uh, and so they were part of this second team. Now, what's not well known is that Operation Lusty had a third team. And that third team, their exclusive job was to find Germany's flying saucers and bring those flying saucers back into the United States. And we know that's actually what happened because many years later, uh, we have accounts of German flying saucers being held at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and then being transported to Area 51. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, uh, so Dr. Shen is part of this science team interviewing scientists that were involved in all of these breakthrough aeronautical uh, technologies, whether it was V1 rockets, whether it was uh, jet fighters or flying saucers, very important. So his job was to interview people. So here you have him along with um, uh, several others, uh, including uh, one of the German scientists, Ludwig Prague, who was uh, uh, being uh, interrogated about what he knew about uh, Nazi Germany's breakthrough aerospace technologies. And the other guy uh, with the cap on, uh, on the far left in the jacket, uh, that's Hugh Dryden. He became the first administrator of NASA in 1959 when, when, when NASA was created. So that's a, quite a historic photo. And of course, Dr. Shen is in there. He's on the other side with, the, uh, with that kind of uh, cap and holding a a folder of some sort. So pivotal time. Now, one of the interesting things about Dr. Shen, a Chinese scientist given this temporary rank of colonel, interviewing, interrogating German scientists. I mean, just kind of think of that, a, a Chinese national. He wasn't even an American citizen. He was a Chinese national. And the only reason he was there was because of his brilliance and because Dr. von Kármán, that was the head of the scientific team, recognized Dr. Shen's brilliance and, and said that this guy is essential for us understanding these breakthrough aerospace technologies. And that's why General Arnold gave the okay to that because it's, this is very, very unusual. You, you don't get uh, the, the most uh, highly classified scientific team going to Germany to investigate Germany's most advanced aerospace technologies and interrogate scientists unless that person is an American um, citizen and, and, and with all the right security clearances and so forth. But that just shows you the power of Dr. von Kármán that he was able to persuade General Arnold that Dr. Shen had to be in this team because he was just a leader, a scientific leader, because he was just out, his brilliance stood out amongst the pack. So Dr. Shen uh, was someone given a, a lot of um, responsibility uh, by the Army Air Force.
And uh, what was very interesting was that one of the one of the German scientists that uh, Dr. Shen interrogated was Werner von Braun, which is kind of really an interesting historical fact, because here you have the future father of uh, China's secret space, of China's space programs, interrogating the father of Germany's, well, what would have been Germany's space program, who later on was taken to the United States under Operation Paperclip, and established America's space program. So quite a, quite a unique set of uh, events. So Dr. Shen, uh, he's interrogating all of these um, scientists and all these German scientists, he's interrogating them, making recommendations in terms of who's gonna be brought back to the United States, who's just gonna allow to live a normal life in occupied Germany. And so he's making those recommendations and so when he gets back, he plays a key role in writing a blueprint, a blueprint for the Army Air Force in terms of the technologies, the breakthrough aerospace technologies that had been encountered in Nazi Germany and making recommendations for uh, how the Army Air Force can develop these. So we know this, uh, that uh, Dr. Shen was one of the key people in writing this report. Here you have a, a declassified um, document. It's called Towards New Horizons. And it was basically a report by Dr. Von Kármán uh, to, uh, uh, to the Army Air Force. Um, and this was submitted on behalf of the Army Air Force Scientific Advisory Group. So in this Toward New Horizon document, there are a number of articles putting together a blueprint for what the Army Air Force needs to do in terms of developing some of these breakthrough technologies. So this is a declassified version uh, or, or an unclassified version. There, there is also a, predictably a classified version dealing with more sensitive um, information. But with the declassified version, we see um, Dr. Shen appearing very prominently. Uh, prominently. Here you have uh, the very first article uh, by uh, Theodore von Kármán, and, and in that article, uh, science the key to air supremacy. So that's the first article kicking off toward New Horizon. The very next, um, uh, you have uh, Dr. von Kármán writing those first two articles, where we stand, science the key to supremacy. And then you have the next set of articles uh, beginning part one. The first one is uh, by Dr. Shen, high speed aerodynamics. And you can see the, the, the prominent role Dr. Shen had in writing this uh, detailed report for the Army Air Force toward New Horizons in terms of the number of papers he submitted. So here you have a sample of some of those. Uh, so in, in, part, in part two, you had uh, Dr. Shen submitting a paper on experimental and theoretical performance of aerospace engines. Um, then another paper on performance of ramjets and their design problems, uh, future, trends in the design and development of solid and liquids in fuel rockets. So, um, you know, he's looking at all of these breakthrough aerospace technologies, but in part five, possibility of atomic fuels, aircraft propulsion of power plants. So that shows you the kind of breadth of knowledge that uh, Dr. Shen had in terms of the different things that were needed to know about developing uh, the propulsion systems, uh, the, uh, the kind of fuel that is going to be needed for these breakthrough aerospace technologies. And so you need to think in terms of, well, this is the declassified version of Toward New Horizons. What did the classified version say? And, and did it discuss flying sources? Well, I, I would say there was a classified version. It did discuss the captured flying sources that the Nazis had developed um, and that Dr. Shen, just as he played a role with these um, unclassified aerospace uh, technologies. He also played a role in analyzing them and, and the potential of those flying saucer technologies for the, for the future. So uh, what, what happened next was that after, after the end of the Second World War, the scientific advisory group is, is abolished um, at the beginning of 1946. Uh, but uh, then General Arnold, 
accepts a proposal that there needs to be a permanent scientific group established to advise the Army Air Force on how to develop these breakthrough technologies. So you had the formation of the Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, and once again, this, this was formed in 1946, and uh, Dr. Shen was a member of the Scientific Advisory Board from 1946 to 1949. And uh, he was a member of the Aerospace Vehicles Panel examining breakthrough technologies. So one of the things to keep in mind here is that in this period, 1947 to 1949, the Scientific Advisory Board actually advised the Army Air Force on how to understand captured flying saucer technologies. So you didn't just have flying saucer technologies that were brought over from, the, um, from Nazi Germany um, in, in 1945 but you also had crash retrievals in uh, Roswell, 1947, Aztec, 1948. I think there was another one, Kingman, Arizona, 1949, uh, Farmington. So there were a number of flying saucer incidents and crashes in the United States in this period. And we know for a fact from uh, leaked majestic documents that the Scientific Advisory Board and Dr. Von Kármán in particular were going to these crash sites, analyzing the remnants of these crashed extraterrestrial spacecraft. And then the entire scientific advisory board would discuss that and, and how you could develop that, how the Air Force could develop that. And we know that Dr. Shen, uh, he was part of this aerospace vehicles panel. And they were, that was the precise panel that would be establishing, that would be examining the remains of these flying saucer crashes that, that the Army Air Force had retrieved from Roswell, Aztec, uh, and so forth. So, so this was very important, this period, 19, 1946 to 1949, when Shen was part of this scientific advisory board, because that's when uh, he was exposed to some of the captured extraterrestrial flying saucer technologies, and he was helping the Army Air Force to understand these. Now, in 1947, September 18, 1947, you have the formation of the US Air Force. Um, and so the US Air Force basically inherited the Scientific Advisory Board. So Dr. Shen was basically uh, doing this work right up until 1949. Now, 19, in 1949, something happened. Uh, he made a, a move he moved uh, from MIT. He had been recruited, at that time, he had been recruited to go to MIT um, as a full professor. Uh, and uh, then he moved back to the Los Angeles area to go back to Caltech and, and become the uh, Goddard Professor of uh, Aerospace. Now, in, in this period, 1950, when he went back to JPL and, and Caltech, he still had his security clearances. He's still working on these breakthrough aerospace technologies. And he became a, a household name. Kind of like how today uh, you have uh, uh, people like uh, Carl Sagan was uh, very prominent in the news media when he was alive. Um, and, and today you, you have others kind of having a very similar role in, in terms of like discussing breakthrough, tech, breakthrough technologies. So... Dr. Shen was in the 1950s, in 1950 in particular, he began discussing the possibility of a rocket propelled civilian craft that would take people from New York to Los Angeles in 30 minutes using rocket propulsion. So, this, so he's discussing supersonic civilian rocket planes back in 1950 and said that these were under development back at the time. So he was really a, a rock star in terms of the aerospace industry in the United States. So you could think about that. He's a full professor at Caltech, member of JPL with all of these classified, all of these uh, security clearances. He's studying all of these breakthrough aerospace technologies for the US Air Force, uh, has, was a prominent part of the scientific advisory group. And then something really, really bizarre happened. Um, in 1950, he's arrested. He's arrested as, uh, on suspicion of being a communist spy. 
on suspicion. There was no hard evidence. It was just the FBI said that based on things that another person said, that they suspected him of being a communist spy. And because of that, he was going to be deported. Now, the problem was that he knew too much. So when the FBI and the Immigration and Naturalization Service said, well, we're going to deport this guy because uh, he's a communist uh, sympathizer. We suspect he's a communist spy. We're going to deport him. Um, and, and he was arrested. Well, uh, they, they said that they're going to deport him. Uh, Dr. Shen was so upset uh, about this that he said, okay, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go back to China and I'm going to take all my papers with me. So he put together all his scientific papers, uh, put them into trunks and sent them off to be shipped back to China, to Hong Kong at the time. Uh, Immigration and Nationalization Service kind of saw this, said that some of these papers appear to be classified and he was arrested, uh, held in jail for, uh, in INS uh, facilities for a, for a week before he was released. And then there was a legal battle because the State Department said, no, you can't deport this guy. He knows too much. You can't deport him. You've got to wait um, until his information becomes outdated. So that's what happened. So from 1950 to 1955, um, there was this tug of war between the State Department and the FBI and uh, INS over when to release um, Dr. Shen and allow him to go back to China. So the, the question here is, well, why did the US authorities allow Chen to be arrested, humiliated, and deported to China? I mean, this, this guy at the time, he was a rock star, full professor, JPL, former full professor at MIT, a rock star in the aerospace industry. So why did they allow him? Why did the FBI and the uh, uh, INS arrest and humiliate this guy? Now, you know, this is, this is the question that is a very important one to consider here because I, I don't think it was an accident. Um, in my book, The Rise of the Red Dragon, I, I raised three possibilities. You know, one, that it was an accident, uh, that this was just a result of the McCarthy era. This was a time when anyone suspected of having links to communism, international communism, uh, was basically considered to be a person that had no place in the United States. Um, and, and so if they were US nationals, uh, they would uh, be hounded out of academia, hounded out of any kind of think tank. Um, if they were foreign nationals, they would be deported. So, you know, was that an accident? Well, that's a possibility as I discuss in the book, but what I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on with this webinar is exploring the second possibility, which is that this was all a plot, that this was a plan, that this was something that had been orchestrated by the deep state. 